My name is Bill Boyce. I am vice chair of the commission, and I'd like to add my welcome and my enthusiasm for uh, the gathering that we're starting today, and it's going to stretch through Friday. Uh, I'm going to be your MC for the afternoon session, and I would like to begin by introducing our first speaker, Dr. Javier Amador. Dr. Amador is president of the LEAP Institute and the Henry Amador Center on Anasognesia, as well as a family caregiver of two close relatives with serious mental illness. About 50% of individuals with mental illness struggle with this condition, which is the inability to recognize their mental health condition. This leads to resistance, uh, resistance to treatment, resistance to medication. As a leading expert in the field, Dr. Amador will explain the complexities of this lack of insight. Welcome, Dr. Amador. Thank you. Good afternoon. Whoa, that was an echo, wasn't it? I feel like I'm in Shea Stadium. I guess it's not Shea Stadium anymore. Um, so I'm going to be talking about a problem. And Benjamin, if you want me to use the podium, if that helps with the echo, just let me know. We're okay? Good. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to talk about a problem that's very near and dear to my heart personally, which I'll explain in a moment, although I think you can guess from the, from the uh, introduction. But let me start with just a, a quick poll. How many of you, raise your hand, have ever encountered someone that you're trying to help who says something along the lines of, I'm not sick, I don't need help? Did you raise your hands? Keep your hands up. Look around the room, folks. You just saved me three data slides about what's happening in our criminal justice system, about how many people with serious mental illnesses, and I'm going to be focusing primarily on schizophrenia and related disorders, but how many people tell us there's nothing wrong, I don't need your help, I don't need your court diversion, <laughs> I don't need treatment, uh, I don't need supported housing, etc. And ultimately, I'm going to talk about how do we help people with that problem, with that difficulty, uh, that tongue twister of a symptom called anosognosia. It's really hard to pronounce, but I'm going to help you with that. How do we help them? Uh, engage with the treatments that we're offering if we're a clinician uh, or if you're a judge, uh, a program that you're making available to the person. So I'm going to start where I started in this. Um, it was mentioned that I have two relatives with serious mental illness. Uh, one is my son and then the other one is my brother Henry. This is a picture of Henry and me. We uh, had immigrated from Cuba and this is taken in Cincinnati, Ohio, where we ended up uh, immigrating to. And Henry's looking in the window. I'm the little guy pretending to drive the car. And we had landed in Ohio after our father's uh, murder, frankly, after the revolution. So my mother had four children without a husband, lost everything. So it was a very precarious, very scary time for us. And my brother Henry was, was much more than a brother. He was my best friend. And take my word for it, from this picture forward for the next 20 years, we were each other's confidant. We were each other's uh, supporters. We were best friends. But 20 years later, 1981, I'm in New York studying psychology. I'm an undergraduate. And my brother is living at home with my mom and my stepfather. My mom remarried a wonderful guy. And um, Henry calls me from Arizona, where they were living. I answer the phone, and Henry says, come home quick. I killed Dad, and hung up the phone. I didn't for a second think he'd actually harmed our, our stepfather. Uh, and I was right, thankfully. I got him back on the phone. It took about an hour. And he began to describe these delusions. He began to talk about voices he was hearing. It was very clear to me, even though I was only a senior in college, that my brother was suffering from mental illness. It was obvious to me. Flew home, and I'm in the living room with my siblings. Henry's holed up in his bedroom, feeling incredibly guilty for having killed our stepfather. Really guilty. Suicidally guilty. He was talking about killing himself. Uh, he had a delusion that he'd been playing the guitar, and the music had been transmitted into our father's head, causing him to trip and fall while he was jogging. 
That's obviously not how he died. He died from a heart attack and jogging, uh, not from music being transmitted from a guitar. So I'm in the living room with my other siblings. Henry's alone, guilt-ridden in his bedroom. And our blended family was like the mega Brady Bunch. There were nine of us. So my other siblings all point to me and say, you go help Henry. You're the psychologist, um, which is absurd. I was a senior in college. Um, I think the reason they drafted me, they selected me, was because of how close Henry and I were. Uh, and, th and that picture is just one example of how close we were. Uh, so I went and I talked to him. Knocked on his door, went in and said, Henry, it's, it's clear you've got these ideas that just aren't true. He also had other delusions about our mother being the devil, being Satan, uh, really bizarre stuff and hallucinations. He that's the first time I heard somebody say, I'm not sick. I don't need help. Leave me alone. Have any of you heard this one? You're the crazy one, not me. Yeah, right? I heard that one for the first time back in 1981. And um, I argued with him. Oh, well, first I was gentle and I was soft about it. But eventually I started arguing with him about it. And it took me a week. How do you think I got him to the hospital? Anybody want to take a guess? Just shout it out. You don't have to walk up to a microphone. How did I get him after a week of saying, you need help, you're not well, and him saying, I'm not sick, I don't need help, leave me the F alone. How did I get him to the hospital? Any guesses? Excuse me? I, I called the police. Yes. I called the police. They were fantastic. This was long before we had crisis intervention team training. I went out front and I met them. I said, look, he doesn't have a weapon. He's not threatening to hurt anybody, but he is talking about suicide. Officers were fantastic, got him safely to the hospital. He gets treated. He gets antipsychotic medication. The hallucinations disappear. The delusions get better. I'm excited. My brother's back, right? No longer guilt-ridden because he's no longer delusional, no longer thinking about suicide. So a month hospitalization, believe it or not, this is back in the 1980s, he's better. He meets with a psychiatrist. We're sitting around this big round table, and the psychiatrist says, Henry, you've got schizophrenia. It's a medication you're taking. You probably have to take it for the rest of your life. Do you understand? And Henry said, I get it. Yeah, sure. I'll do it. We go home. Mom makes dinner. I'm doing the dishes. Henry's back in his room. And uh, I, I could have thrown something out under the sink in the trash bin. What do you think I found there? How'd you guys read my mind? How'd you know? Right? So I take his bottle of pills out of the trash can. I walk over to his room. I knock on the door. I said, what the heck is going on? You said that you understood you had to take this medication. And he said, well, I needed it then, which was five hours ago. I needed it then. I don't need it anymore. That started a seven-year period where our relationship looked like this picture. Henry running away from me, running away from police officers, running away from mental health care professionals who wanted to help him. He was uh, involuntarily admitted probably about 20 times in the end, he got common sense and learned to sign himself in voluntarily, voluntarily so he can get out more quickly. Uh, it wasn't that he had insight. He just knew that if he signed himself in, he could get out more quickly. He was homeless for a while, uh, not working, not in school, no friends, no girlfriend, which he desperately wanted a girlfriend, uh, not doing well. Now, during this period, I was back in New York, and I was actually becoming a psychologist, and I was on my internship year, my last year, of training. And I had a patient on an inpatient unit exactly like my brother. She was, I would talk to her, like say you were her. And I'm, I'm telling her, this is your diagnosis. This is the treatment you need, et cetera. And what did she say to me? Leave me, that, leave me alone. I don't need any of this. Just let me out of the hospital. And I was really frustrated with her. So I went and talked to my supervisor and I'm telling him the story that I just told you in more detail. And he says, Javier, stop. So I stopped talking. He says, no. I said, stop talking at her. She's not hearing you. Start asking her questions. What does she want? I mean, real fundamental stuff that I had, had never been trained to do, actually. I'd been trained to go in with a checklist and to educate her. So I did that. I went out and talked to her. And what do, what do you think she said? The first thing she said was, I don't want to be in the hospital. I want to get out. And I said, I can work with you on that. The second thing is, I want my mom to stop calling the police. I said, I can work with you on that. Within two weeks, had her out of the hospital. She had accepted medication. Her mother and I were meeting with her in a clinic for the rest of my internship year. So I was blown away 
something so fundamental and simple as shut up and start listening um, really made a huge difference. And it's, it's more than that, but it was primarily that. Uh, so I called my brother. You know, this is our relationship, him running away. And I said a couple of things. I said, Henry, I'm sorry for all these years I've been telling you you're mentally ill. I'll never do it again. And I kept that promise. I never told him again he had mental illness. Second thing I said was, I'm sorry for all the times I told you you needed medication. I will never do that again. And I kept that promise. Counterintuitively, within six months of that shift in how I was interacting with him, he accepted a long-acting injectable medication, stayed on it for the rest of his life, nearly 20 years, had uh, two volunteer jobs, went to a clubhouse, had a girlfriend, was in recovery, was doing great. I asked him in the last year of his life, we, we had a, he was, you know, during this period, I have to tell you, I thought my brother was selfish because our mother had been through so much. How could you do this to her? Like he was doing something to her. I mean, I made a lot of mistakes and I forgot what a, what a big heart we're talking about big hearts this morning. What a big heart my brother had. He was getting on a bus and he noticed that a woman was struggling with her groceries. So he steps off the bus, he's helping her. And somebody who said he had a diabetic episode uh, ran onto the sidewalk and killed my brother. Um, why am I telling you this? Um, I guess to really emphasize how much I had lost sight of the person when I was arguing with him. And also to underscore, he didn't die from his illness. He didn't die from suicide. And the suicide rate is very high in schizophrenia, schizoaffective and bipolar disorder. About 10%, one out of 10 people die from suicide. Um, he died being Henry, a really good guy. And our relationship looked like this. That's Henry on the right. That's me with the Jerry Seinfeld haircut. Um, <laughs> I thought it was cool back then. I used to have a mustache too. I was, anyway, I look like a 70s porn star. Um, sorry. I don't think I've ever made that joke. I think I better... My wife is here, I'm looking at her like, am I really screwing up? No, I'm okay. Um, so our relationship was back. And as I said, he was in recovery. So this was the beginning of my understanding that we were doing it wrong, the field was doing it wrong. And so when I started my research career, it really uh, informed what I ended up focusing on. And I'm gonna be talking about that. I'm gonna uh, convey to you what I know about the nature of this problem, its impact, and how we can help people engage in the, in the services and the treatments we're offering. But first, let's talk about stories of crimes that end up in the news media. Rather than stories of recovery, you're going to hear Matt Rutan, who's a good friend and someone I really admire and am inspired by, uh, uh, after I speak. He's going to talk about his lived experience. And we don't hear the stories like Matt's too often in the news media. But here's one of the stories that we do hear. This is Margaret Mary Ray. Anyone know who Margaret Mary Ray was? Anyone remember David Letterman's stalker? Yeah, sad that, that we remember her that way. She had the delusion that she was married to the late night celebrity TV show host. So she'd go to his house, he'd come back from the studio up to Greenwich, Connecticut, she'd be in the house. She's like, honey, hi, how was work? And he'd go and call the police. Uh, she got time in front of judges, she got time uh, you know, arrested. She, did, she never accepted treatment, never understood she had mental illness. She died from suicide. By the way, I don't say people commit suicide in the context of serious mental illness. The brain research that I've familiarized myself with indicates to me that like you can die from cardiac disease, cancer, and other medical conditions, you die from suicide. You don't commit it. But that's a very sad ending uh, and, and a too frequent scenario where somebody ends up in our criminal justice system rather than our mental health care system because she was certain there was nothing wrong with her. So I have a question for you. Denial, I'm putting it in quotes for a reason, impairs common sense judgment about the need for treatment and services you might be offering. Would you agree with that? Raise your hand if you agree with that. Okay, it looks like most of you. Anybody disagree? Okay, I might be alone. I disagree. If I come over here and take the perspective of Henry Amador, Margaret Mary Ray, whose story I just told you about, or roughly six million Americans 
with serious mental illness who do not understand they have mental illness? If I take their perspective, it's common sense to refuse treatment. Let me put it another way. How many of you, raise your hand, would inject yourselves with insulin knowing for a fact you do not have diabetes? Raise your hand if you would do that. No hands going up. Common sense, right? It would be kind of crazy to do that. It would be life-threatening. It could cause serious damage, if not kill you. And that's the nature of what it's like when you have this kind of denial. But are we dealing with denial? More often than not, the research I'm going to review for you, sorry about that, um, the research I'm going to re review for you indicates we're dealing with anisognosia. It's a tongue twister. If you want to learn how to say it, I use this trick. A woman named Ann knows egg. <laughs> Nosea, anisognosia. You want to say it on the count of three with me? Seriously, humor me for a second. I'll explain why. One, two, three. Anosignosia. One more time. Anosignosia. Good. Why? Because if you come away from this talk thinking this is important, or if you already knew about this and didn't know how to pronounce the word, you can't talk about it. So it's just useful for us to be able to talk about it. I did not come up with this term. This was coined by the uh, uh, neurologist Babinski in 1919. Those of you who have had newborns might know about the Babinski reflex in newborns. He also described people who after stroke were paralyzed on one side of their body and they didn't know it. And I've evaluated people like this because I did a one-year neurology rotation and it's remarkable. How can you be paralyzed and not know it? Really profound unawareness of illness. That's a consequence of brain damage, not a consequence of denial or stubbornness or repression. So let me talk about somebody like that. This is a study I did with my colleagues at Hillside Hospital in Queens. And we looked at neurological patients. These are not psychiatric patients. And we looked at patients who had frontal lobe damage and then damage to other parts of the brain. And we looked at their problems with awareness of various neurological symptoms they had. So here's a very standard test. You ask the person in a neuropsychological test battery, draw this clock, indicate the right time. Now, as part of the research study, we asked this man on a scale of one to seven, seven being a great copy, one being a terrible copy, how do you think he'll do? And he said, seven, right? How many of you think he'd do a seven? I think I would. No, really? Six, right? It's an easy task. Did he have a problem? Right? I asked him then, how did you do on that same scale? And he said seven. So not only was he unaware of this neurological symptom, it's called a construction apraxia, but he also was unaware when presented with the evidence that he had this problem. He didn't process it. It didn't change his understanding. He still thought he had done a good drawing. Profound unawareness, not just of uh, the big symptoms like paralysis, but even things like this, things that are more subtle. And when I started pointing to the 12, I pointed to the 12 inside that rough circle, and I asked him, what number is that? He, he said 12. And then I started pointing to the 12s outside the circle, and he said 12, 12, 12. There's four 12s outside. 12, he started to flush. <laughs> and then I asked him, how many 12s in the clock? Instead of answering me, he pushed the paper away and said, that's not my drawing. Why, what are you doing? So he didn't become aware. Instead, he confabulated. And it was a paranoid confabulation that I was trying to trick him somehow. And what are confabulations? Our brains are basically making up stories to explain gaps in our memories and perceptions. And in his case, he knew he could draw that simple clock, and there was this gap between what he was looking at and what he knew to be true. And so he confabulated and became paranoid. So let me talk about some research on anosognosia in schizophrenia and bipolar disorder and the disorders that lie between those two. So schizoaffective disorder, delusional disorder, psychotic disorder, NOS, et cetera. So back in, in uh, 1991, my colleagues and I at, at Columbia University uh, did a review, a comprehensive review of the literature. It turns out there wasn't a lot of literature. There were only about 12 studies uh, in the research liter literature about this problem of awareness of illness and schizophrenia. So what did we learn? 
Well, the early research findings found that this was a really common problem. This is a study by, by Will Carpenter and, and John Strauss for the World, World Health Organization, an international pilot study on schizophrenia. What did they find? About 89% of the schizophrenia patients in their study did not believe they had schizophrenia, 89%. Now these are uh, over 800 patients from developing countries and, and developed countries. Big WHO study. And they found the most common symptom of schizophrenia, they were calling it a symptom back in 1973, was poor insight. This study, 13 years later, replicated that finding. Same methodology, patients from around the world, developing countries, developed countries, and they found the exact same, almost the exact same thing. The most common symptom was poor insight in over 80% of the sample. That's an overestimation, and I can talk a little bit about that in a few minutes. But this study is also very important, and it's also been replicated uh, many times. This is uh, Joe McAvoy and his colleagues at, at Duke University. They looked at people over a two-year period, and people who were successfully treated people with schizophrenia. And they measured insight, they called it insight, as well as symptoms. So even when symptoms improved, even like with my brother, the delusions and hallucinations resolved with treatment, turns out after a two year period, the majority of the patients in their study had the same level of insight. So insight tended not to improve with treatment. And that really, when I read that, it, it made sense with my experience, but I also kind of, had always hoped that if you get someone in treatment, they're gonna develop insight. Research indicates that's, that's more than likely not gonna be true. So we gotta find another way to engage people that doesn't result their becoming aware that they have a condition. So where else do we see anosognosia? It turns out in the frontal lobes. Now why am I saying that? Because some of you who are in the field will be thinking, well wait a minute, it's the parietal lobes, it's the anterior portion of the brain that is involved in anosognosia. Well, McGlynn and Schachner uh, did a, lot, a big review of case studies and basically it's in the frontal lobes. Why is that important? Well, it led to a hypothesis that we, we knew for about 50 years that people with schizophrenia have frontal lobe dysfunction. We also know that to be true in bipolar disorders, schizoaffective disorder, and there's evidence as well in, in substance use disorders, hypofrontality, lower functioning frontal lobes basically. Uh, so we thought that the patients who had frontal lobe dysfunction would be more likely to be unaware of their illness. Right away, people set out to uh, test our hypothesis. There, I could make four slides. This only goes up to what, 2004? 2000, yeah, 2004. Um, there's another 19 years of slides I could show you. Uh, long and short of it is, these are studies of neuropsychological tests which are evaluating how the brain is working, how it's functioning, right? Not how it looks, how it's working. And what these investigators all found were strong, moderate to strong co correlations between hypofrontality, problems with frontal lobe functioning, executive dysfunction, and lack of awareness of being ill. So we, we actually have more evidence that poor insight is anosognosia, then we do have evidence that delusions are a consequence of, of a brain disorder. We have a lot more evidence. But this is how the brain is functioning. How about the way the, the brain works? I mean, looks, sorry. I just talked about how, how it works or doesn't work. Uh, these are 20 studies that compared the brains of people with schizophrenia before, uh, who were aware that they were ill, compared to those who were unaware that they were ill. So these are both post-mortem studies and brain imaging studies. So now we're looking at the way the brain looks, right? Structural abnormalities. All of these studies found significant differences between the aware subjects and unaware subjects in one or more brain regions, primarily though involving the frontal and prefrontal cortex. So things like what? Reduced gray matter, you know, fewer neurons in the prefrontal cortex. There's a lot of other findings as well. If during the Q&A you're interested, I can tell you about them. But here's a list of, of some of the, the, the most common findings. Three of the studies involved people who had never been in treatment. Now, to me, this is noteworthy for a couple of reasons. First of all, first episode patients 
we find have these brain differences, abnormalities or differences, that predict if they will understand they have illness or not. Second, it indicates that antipsychotic medications aren't causing you know, brain damage, aren't causing these differences that we see. So one more little bit of research. This is um, a study that we did at Columbia as part of the, the DSM. Everybody knows what the DSM is, right? Anyone not know? It's okay if you don't know, just raise your hand. Okay, so the DSM-3 was getting revised to DSM-4. This is back in 1999, and we were doing this big research study. It's called the field trial, and I'm gonna show you results just from the schizophrenia subjects, but the results I'm gonna show you, we found the same thing in these other disorders I'm talking about today, including bipolar disorder. We found that roughly 60% were moderately to severely unaware that they had mental illness, in this case, schizophrenia. This is over 200 patients with schizophrenia. Now, moderate unawareness means, I know you think I'm mentally ill, I can see that people believe that, but I, I, I know I'm not. Completely unaware is, nobody really believes that they're just saying it, and, and I'm not unaware. This finding has been replicated close to 300 times now in the research literature. It is abundantly clear, as was said in, in my introduction, that about half of all people with these disorders at any given time do not understand they're mentally ill. Other research indicates that at any given time is over the course of years, that level of unawareness stays the same. We also looked at unawareness of signs and symptoms of mental illness. And we found that there are all kinds of deficits in awareness. So if somebody had thought disorder, that second symptom listed, so they were circumstantial, they had loose associations, maybe word salad, where they're just words don't connect, they're not making sense. You can ask that person, do you have difficulty being understood? Do you have difficulty communicating? And what we found is over 50% who have that symptom didn't know they had the symptom. So what's the headline? When you look at the research, and that, this has been well replicated, by the way, over and over again, it's not just one study. When you look at the research, the problem isn't just that someone feels stigma and says, no, I don't have this schizophrenia or bipolar. It's unawareness of the diagnosis, but also unawareness of signs and symptoms that make up the diagnosis. Now, some people will, will have pockets of awareness and unawareness, um, but the point is that, that it's not simply unawareness of the diagnosis. One last thing about, about research on this kind of unawareness. Um, Tardive dyskinesia, uh, particularly the first generation antipsychotics, um, but all of them can cause what are called extra pyramidal symptoms and that can move into tardive dyskinesia, involuntary movements, kind of Parkinsonian movements. So you can ask somebody who has perioral grimacing, you probably can't see that, or their pill rolling movements in their hands or shoulders are doing this. You can ask them, do you have difficulty controlling your shoulder movements, your facial muscles, et cetera? These studies found 50% of the schizophrenia patients who have this movement disorder didn't know they had the movement disorder. So why am I going into the weeds here with the data? Because the, the, the main point here is that it's clear that in these mental health conditions, there are all kinds of difficulties with self-appraisal self-awareness. The way I tend to think of this is it's not simply unawareness. It's a knowledge of oneself that's stranded in the time before the person became ill. So all the same abilities, capacities that I had, you know, for example, in my 20s, I still have today. And I'm sorry for the stereotypical picture, but we'll come up with a better one eventually. Um, so what about the field? How, how many of you are mental health care clinicians? Okay, how many? quite a lot of us. How many of you heard about anosognosia before? Pretty close to the whole. This is making me very happy. Wow. Because I'll tell you what, there's a big gap between science and practice. A lot of people raise their hands that they've heard of it before in, in this context. Um, when we were revising the DSM, 
Uh, 23 years ago, uh, Dr. Michael Flaum and myself were asked by the American Psychiatric Association to head up, kind of like journal editors, the revision. And so we put together a panel of experts and asked them to look, to look at all the research and tell us what you think. What's the, what's the scientific consensus? And here's what's in the DSM. A majority of people with schizophrenia uh, have poor insight regarding the fact that they have this illness, a psychotic illness. And evidence suggests that this is a manifestation of the illness. Not denial, not a coping strategy. And it may be comparable to what we see in patients with stroke called anosognosia. So this is 23 years in our DSM. This symptom, it's been called a symptom for that long. Actually, since that 1973 study by Carpenter and colleagues, they, they were calling it a symptom back then. Not somebody being difficult, not somebody being in denial. This symptom predisposes the person to noncompliance with treatment. And we have other research that indicates services as well. Uh, predicts higher relapse rates, big surprise. Increased number of involuntary hospitalizations, poor functioning psychosocially, work, education, relationships, poor course of illness. Well, this is 23 years ago, right? Why am I bringing this up? Because it was the only peer-reviewed scientific consensus version of the DSM. But the DSM-5 also has something to say about, about this problem. Unawareness of illness is typically a symptom, not a coping strategy. It is comparable to what we see following all kinds of brain damage termed anosognosia. It includes unawareness of symptoms, that, that research I was showing you just a few moments ago, and may be present through the entire course of the illness. We also see it in schizoaffective disorder, and it predicts all kinds of negative outcomes. So all the ones that were listed 20 years before in the DSM-4, but there's one addition, I don't know if you can catch it, which is anosognosia also predicts aggression. Not violent behavior, but aggression. So anger and threats. That's not a surprise to me, having worked with probably thousands now of people with this condition. Um, it's a very lonely place to be in. I know I'm not ill. There's nothing wrong with me. And everybody around me is telling me I'm mentally ill and I need treatment. Um, I get angry. I get defensive, right? So I'm not surprised by that finding. Let's talk about treatment for a moment. And, um, and I just want to say very briefly, I'm really, I'm really grateful and honored to be here because the work you guys are doing is transformative. And from my perspective as a family member and somebody as a psychologist who's been in the field for 30 plus years, we need this bad. <laughs> we need all the various things you're all doing um, from law enforcement through the courts and beyond. Um, too many times people are, end up in our criminal justice system. But what's the problem? People either refuse to take them or they stop telling them, like my brother did, throwing them in the garbage without telling anybody, right? This study found that 50 to 75% of people with schizophrenia did not take the medication at all or only took a tiny little bit of it. Longitudinal study looking at people over time found over a two-year period. So if any of you are prescribers or are working with patients like this, if your patients are anything like the patients in this study, after seven to 10 days, one quarter were off the medication. Within a year, half were off the medication. Two years, three quarters. Big, big problem. This is really well replicated. Probably isn't a surprise to this group, right? People tend to not want to be in treatment uh, who have this condition, who have anosognosia. So what treatment can you offer? What treatment can you advocate for what treatment can you support in your work? There's two things. One is Clozaril, which I can talk about during the Q&A, why, why, why I'm suggesting that. But the other one is long-acting injectable medications. Uh, this study found that half, like most studies find, on oral medication stopped compared to only 17% on long-acting injectables. Flip those numbers around. 83% who were getting injections, like my brother did, kept taking the medication. Now, my brother, when I, when I spoke to him in the last, last year of his life, we had a face-to-face -face conversation. I was visiting him in, in Arizona. I said, hey, Henry, you know, he knew I talked about him. He had a copy of my book. 
where he's talked about a lot in the book. I don't think he ever read it, um, but it's dedicated to him, and he was very proud of his little brother. Um, I said, hey, Henry, people ask me when I talk about you, do, does your brother Henry know that he has schizophrenia? schizophrenia? What do you think? And he laughed and he says, no, Javi, I don't have schizophrenia. I said, well, why are you taking these injections? I wasn't afraid to ask the question. So why are you taking these injections? He says, well, I do it for you and for mom and pops. Mom and pops were Betty and James. They ran the, the uh, supported living arrangement that he lived in. So what's his answer? I'm taking the medications for relationships. Not because he had developed any insight or any awareness. Um, but he was on a long-acting injectable. And, and why are they superior? I think it's kind of common sense. When somebody's on an oral medication who doesn't understand that they have an illness, every day, once a day, twice a day, three times a day, sometimes even four times a day, they have to fight, the person has to fight the impulse to throw the medication away. I don't need this, right? Over and over and over again. Compared to long-acting injectables, where the person's going once a month or once every three months in a social environment, right? Meeting the receptionist, maybe going with a caseworker, uh, with the nurse or the, the PA uh, to get the injection. Totally different scenario. And the common sense benefits, I, I think, are pretty obvious, but I'm going to state them anyway. It's a smoke detector. If somebody misses an appointment, we know they're not on medication and we can go and engage with them and talk to them about it, right? And I'm gonna give you a preview of how I think what we recommend, what the research indicates that conversation should look like. But it also reduces tension. When somebody that I'm working with is on a long-acting injectable, I don't have to ask them, are you taking the medication? I know they're taking it, or I know they're not taking it, and we can talk about it. And when I know they're not taking it, I can use different techniques like the LEAP approach, which I'll be, talking, I'll be teaching tomorrow, and I'll give you a preview of today. Uh, I can use those kinds of approaches to help the person decide to make a new appointment and get back on the medication. So there's a lot of benefits to long-acting injectables if, if you're trying to help somebody with a history of noncompliance. So to summarize, what do we know about anosognosia for mental illness and acceptance of treatment? We don't win on the strength of our argument. No evidence, no data is going to convince the person. We win on the strength of our relationship. Let me back up on that one. The research on therapeutic alliance and acceptance of treatment is, is crystal clear that if you can develop a good alliance, and you don't have to be a therapist to develop a good alliance, right? It can be the court, it can be a law enforcement, it could be a social worker, it can be anyone. It can be a family member. We teach this approach to family members. And the research indicates that if the person who does not understand they're ill has a relationship with somebody where they feel listened to with respect and with no judgment, and they know the other person would like them to give treatment a try. Very likely, among the top two predictors, very likely to be in treatment and accept treatment and stay in treatment, which is essentially what happened with my brother. I started respecting his point of view. I never argued with him. I never told him he was mentally ill anymore. I never told him he needed medication. I told him I'd like him to be on it. And we did our little bartering system. He wanted something for me, and we bartered for it. Um, and it worked, right? And he never understood he had an illness. And I think the reason it worked, I know the reason it worked, is that he felt like he could trust me and he felt respected by me and not judged by me. And he felt that I loved him and, and I wasn't trying to undermine him. Um, but in terms of the research, respectful, non-judgmental communication. So what does that look like? If, if the person says to me, my problem is the CIA, in the surveillance. My problem is not that I'm mentally ill. Uh, I'll listen to that, not quietly, but actively with reflective listening. So what you're telling me is you're, you're not mentally ill. Your problem is the CIA. Did I get that right? 
right? That's respect, that's communicating respect for that person's experience. And I'm not judging it. I'm not saying, so you're telling me the CIA is what? You know, I'm not being skeptical about it. So back to anisognosia. When we're talking about anisognosia to somebody who has this problem, how we talk about it really makes a difference in terms of how we think about it and how we're um, uh, influencing other people's thinking about it. So I would encourage you not to say things like, she does not accept she has an illness, as if it's a choice, or he refuses to acknowledge. Would you ever say somebody refuses to stop hallucinating? Anyone? No? Why not? I'm hearing chuckling, but why not? Because we know it's not under their, the person's control, right? And yet we do that, or I did that. I'll speak for myself. For those seven years, my brother and I argued. You know, he just refuses this, to admit to it, right? Denies it, doesn't admit, won't admit, right? As if it's a choice. Refuses to admit. These are things I... Words I used to use and I've heard for many, many years, and I still unfortunately hear today. What can we say? How can we talk about this? Cannot comprehend she has an illness. Is unaware, unable to see, you know, cognitively blind, unable to see or understand that he has mental illness. Ideally, has anisognosia for mental illness. I do a lot of consultations with, with families and clinicians, and I'm finally starting to see this in medical records. Even though it's not a formal subtype yet, I'm seeing it in medical records. I'm also seeing courts cite it for uh, a foundation for inco adjudicative incompetence. So uh, somebody is trying to fire their attorneys and go pro se because the attorneys want to present mental health evidence, and an expert comes in and evaluates anisognosia and there's a few cases I'm aware of, one of which I was involved in, where the, the court makes a decision on incompetence based on this symptom of anisognosia. So quick review. Anisognosia into having a serious mental illness is a neurocognitive symptom. It's stable over time for most people, not everybody. Uh, it does not improve the treatment for most people. Again, not everybody, there's exceptions. This is research, it's done on groups. Um, it is the top predictor of treatment refusals and dropouts. Not a surprise. Predict, predicts all kinds of negative outcomes that the DSM's described. And it's a common barrier to creating a working alliance and at times competency, adjudicative competency, and other kinds of competency, frankly. So, I've reviewed some research and um, told some stories, right? I need a volunteer to see if I can help you all have the experience of what it's like to have anisognosia for mental illness. So this is somebody, I need somebody who's married, not afraid to, to have a microphone placed in their hands, <laughs> uh, currently working, and do I have volunteers? Right there. And have you seen me do this online or anything? Fantastic. Can somebody get her a microphone? Is that, do we have somebody to run a mic? Thank you. Oh, you got one right there. Okay. Thank you. What's your first name? Cindy. 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 Thank you, Cindy. And mm -hmm. your spouse? What's? Ray. Ray? And do you have kids? I forget. Two adult children. Two children. And who's your supervisor, first name? Uh, I'm supervised by myself. By yourself, yeah? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Are you like a Supreme Court justice or something? What's the... No, just judge in my own trial courtroom. Okay. Um, well, here's... I... This makes me very uncomfortable. This is not the LEAP approach, Cindy. Um, I was asked by Ray and his family, his wife Susan, and their two adult children, uh, to talk with you today. They, they know enough about your life that they knew you were going to be here. They, you're going to hear my talk. And, uh, and they knew my work. 
they, they asked me to try to help you. Now, I know you believe, how long do you believe you've been married to Ray? 35. 35 years? Right. Yes. I have about five years of restraining orders I could show you. I could walk down there and show you. Would that convince you that Ray has never been your husband? No. It wouldn't. Bonafide restraining orders would not convince you. No, it would not. Okay. Well, let me ask you this. When you leave this conference, where are you going to go? To my hotel room. Oh, you mean back home? Yeah, when should you get back home? I'm going to go to our home where I live with Ray, and okay. we do not have any kids at home. Here's what's going to happen in reality. Here's what's, let's not laugh, folks. This is actually pretty serious. What's going to happen, it's very serious. You get there, your key's not going to work. Ray and his wife, Susan, are going to realize that you're trying to get into their house again, and the police are going to get called. And they're going to take you into custody. Do you resist, or do you go peacefully? Oh, I resist. You resist. So they're able to take you into custody despite your resistance. And you're in front of a mental health court judge, and I'm that judge. Ma'am, I am really sorry to see you here. Now, there's, there's good news. If you're willing, we have a way to, to expunge these charges, to, to make this be something in your past. We can go to trial on three charges, violation of restraining order, criminal trespassing, and resisting arrest. Very serious charges. Or, if you accept our mental health diversion, you can meet with our staff. We have a, a young man in the back of the, the courtroom who will meet with you as soon as, as, soon as we're done here. Uh, and if I receive favorable evaluations from your treating psychiatrist over the next six months, we can dismiss this case. What would you like to do? Go to trial or get some treatment? Neither. Neither. Okay, ma'am, I got a full docket. You got to make a decision. Right. Gosh, I'm feeling, I feel like crying. You feel like crying. I'm sorry. Yeah. Completely frustrated that you don't understand that I'm at my own home being arrested. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm sorry that happened to you, but you can fix this problem by getting some treatment. What do you, what do you think you'll do? Be yourself. What would you do? Go to trial. Go to trial. So you go to trial. And where's my lawyer? I want a lawyer. <laughs> <laughs> Judge Cindy. <laughs> you go to trial, and she does a great job. You get, you get probation. Okay? And one of the requirements is that you go and get evaluated and follow your treating doctor's recommendations. Do you make that appointment? I'm fuming. No, I don't make the appointment. You don't make the appointment. So you're in violation of probation. You're back before the judge. Mm -hmm. And it creates more legal problems for you. Let me ask you this. When you leave the courtroom the second time, where do you go? Hmm. Probably to my mom's house. To your mom's house. And your mom says to you, what does she call you? Sweetheart? Sweetie? No, absolutely not. Just Cindy? Cynthia. Absolutely not. <laughs> she doesn't like you very much? She's no? spicy, that one. <laughs> Cynthia. 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 I'm really worried about you. Please go get some help. Please. You don't, need, you don't need to have this charge against you. Go get some help. So that happens. Do you think then you'd realize that, that you've never been married to Ray? You don't have two kids? No, I no, don't. No, of course not. I think um, she's on their side. Yeah. Do you, try, do you try to call Ray or text him or your kids? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And guess what happens? What happens when she does that? You get arrested again. You get back in front of the judge again. You think you'd finally accept treatment? No, I'd be no way. Fuming this about. goes on for five years. Mm -hmm. For five years. Mm -hmm. Do you think then you'd finally realize that you've been delusional, that you have a serious mental illness? No. No. Mm -mm. Ten years. No amount of time. Okay. That's what it's like to have anastagnosia for mental illness. It is a rock solid belief. It does not change no matter how much evidence, no matter how much experience to the contrary. 
Now, let me ask you this. You already started to talk about your feelings. As we were doing this, mm -hmm. um, any feelings you either had or imagined you would have had if this really were happening? I, I literally immediately felt like crying. Like crying? And I'm thinking about all the people in my court. It's a really lonely place to be, for sure. And what would you think, you know, what would you think about Ray and why he's doing this? Imagine this really happened. It'd be devastating, like disloyal and probably feel like harming him, actually. Mm -hmm. <laughs> did she, did she say I feel that like way harming? For less you feel like harming him? Is that what you said? Sentence. Did you say you'd feel like harming him? I would feel like harming him. Okay. And some of you know it. We're going to take a break right now. <laughs> when we come back. Yes. I would hopefully Cindy baby. will be in an ambulance somewhere. Um, <laughs> so, Angria. Is Angria a fair oh. characterization of that? Yes. All right. Suspicious? Would you be suspicious? Very. Right? Paranoid. Now you're getting paranoid. Now my mom's against and me and on your team. Right. And five years go by, you don't see your kids, you don't see him. Mm. Yeah. Lonely, right? Yes. Can we thank Cindy? Thank you so much. <laughs> thank you. Is, is Ray here with you? Is he here with you? He's... Yeah, well, some... <laughs> are you okay? You're okay. All right. Give him a big hug when you get home from me. All right. Thank you so much for helping. Um, I have to tell you, you know, working with, with people who have anosognosia for mental illness are some of the loneliest people I've ever met. I mean, so alone in the world. Uh, and oftentimes scared and angry, too, and traumatized. So when helping somebody who has anosognosia for mental illness. So if I want to help somebody, let's say this was true, what was happening with Cindy. Um, the judge, the attorney, the social worker, caseworker knows best approach. You know, we're the experts. It doesn't work. There's no collaboration. Let's say Cindy's working with me. It's five years later. It's been court ordered. Or maybe I'm her PO, right? And uh, what are we collaborating on? You know, she's trying to figure out what the heck happened to her family. Maybe she's still trying to get back to her family. I can't collaborate with her on that if it's a delusion, like Margaret Mary Ray had about David Letterman. If it's a delusion, I can't help her with that. Uh, we got to find something else to collaborate on. Um, I cannot expect her to be grateful. Cindy, were you grateful for my diagnosis? That no, you don't feel grateful. <laughs> she just pointed that. What were you pointing at me with? <laughs> You do not feel grateful or receptive or adherent. She didn't want to get treatment. She, she decided to go like Margaret Mary Ray, actually. I'll go to trial, right? What we can't expect, and look at these feelings I got up there so quickly, because <laughs> they're so common. Even in a role play, Cindy's describing many of the feelings that are on this slide. Frustration, anger, hostility, fear, suspicion, loneliness, and depression. And, and really severe isolation. I've worked with families with their son. Uh, there's three families I'm working with right now where all three sons uh, decided to go homeless rather than live with their parents who told them that they needed to get treatment. Would much rather be homeless. Um, so how do we engage with people? I, I mentioned earlier that the research indicates a relationship where the person feels heard and listened to, like my brother finally did, like that woman on my internship year felt I was doing. Heard and listened to with respect and a lack of judgment. That's what this approach is all about. And um, it's, it's used by SAMHSA, selected by SAMHSA for their uh, family toolkit. It was developed by Dr. Aaron Beck and myself. For those of you who don't know who Dr. Beck was, he's the creator, the founder, the father of cognitive psychology. And Dr. Beck and I had a grant together to do a short seven-session inpatient uh, psychotherapy to help people who did not understand they had illness accept treatment. And we pulled from like three different schools of thought. We, we didn't invent the tools that you see on the left side of this slide. 
which I'll, I'll go over in just a moment. Um, but what happened was when we were training the therapists for this study, we had psychiatric residents, clinical psychologists, social worker. And then we had a, a, a junior in college, this young woman who was a volunteer, and this was her payback. She gets to be with the very famous Dr. Beck and, and learn from him. So we're training all of these people. She wasn't going to be a, a therapist in the study, but this is, you know, a payback for her. And of all the people we were training, the one who got it the quickest, this approach, was this young woman. And the reason is she didn't have to unlearn all the, all the things that she learned in training. When I was in training, I learned this was denial. I learned that this was um, something that we had to sort of push through, do interventions with the person. Interventions don't work, by the way. When, when trying to help someone with anosognosia, they make things worse. The research on that is clear. So what became apparent to me was that there was a communication program embedded in the psychotherapy. So I lifted that out and with Dr. Beck's uh, blessing, developed the LEAP approach. What does it stand for? Listen reflectively and actively. I'm going to give you some examples of how to do that in a way that's respectful and, and completely devoid of any, any judgment. Empathize very strategically with feelings, especially coming from the anosognosia or delusions. So if I'm working with Cindy, I want to be sure to ask her about those feelings that she has about what happened to her in October of 23 at that conference. What happened to her when she can't reach her husband or her kids? The, the sadness or the anger or the paranoia that she's got. I want to not only listen and empathize with those, but normalize them. So as I'm listening to her, this is what it might sound like, the, the reflective listening and the empathy. So Cindy, if I heard you correctly, that, that crazy doctor told you you were not married to your husband right? And you lost your husband and your kids and you haven't been able to see them since. How do you feel about that? You can just shout it out. You feel what? You feel hurt. How do you feel about losing your husband and kids? Devastated? Yeah, I'd feel that way too. Anyone would. So with this approach, we're not only actively listening and reflecting back, but we're exploring the feelings, and this is really important, normalizing them. I'd feel the same way. Anyone would. And you can do this, no matter who you are in this room. You can do it from the bench. You can do it from, you know, on a street corner. You can do it in your office. Um, how do you feel about this? You know, I'd feel the same way if I were you. Well, do you believe me? I'll talk about how to address that in detail tomorrow. But when we do reflective listening and empathy like this, this active listening and, and, and very strategic empathy, people will often make the mistake of thinking we agree with them. That we think it's true, what they think. Um, and that's okay to let, let that lie for a little while, is what our research shows and, and my clinical experience shows and my personal experience. We then look for areas where we agree. That's the A and the leap approach. So we're not going to agree the person's ill or not. With Cindy, I'm not going to agree whether or not uh, Ray and her are married, but we, we can agree on other things like staying out of jail, not being arrested, right? Getting her job back, right? Getting back to work. Uh, all kinds of things we can agree to partner on and work on those things together. Now, during that process, and these are not steps, these are different tools. Um, there's, DOA may, may look like an uh, unfortunate acronym, but I believe that if we're not doing these kinds of things, our, our relationships are DOA. Um, so things like delaying giving hurtful, contrary opinions. So I'm working with Cindy. It's our second session. I've been doing reflective listening, and I've been empathizing with her and saying, boy, I'd feel devastated too. So you lost your husband. Did I get that right? Right? She says yes. Um, and she asked me, well, doctor, it sure sounds like you, you believe me. Do you? I'm married to Ray. These are my kids. If I can, I want to delay. Why? Because when I do give my opinion, and I probably will have to, not always, but I may have to about this delusion, um, she will have asked for it. It'll be a solicited opinion, not an unsolicited opinion. The other reason, if I want to delay giving my opinion, 
is because um, it, it, it will delay, if not eliminate, hopefully, a moment of, of conflict in our relationship and set us back. So let's talk about the solicited, solicited opinion piece of this. How many women in this room have given birth? Okay, and how many of you during your first pregnancy got free advice from women on the street? Okay, how did it feel? Just shout it out. Unwanted, did it ever feel, okay, unwanted? What else? Invasive. Patronizing? Intrusive? That's invasive, I guess, right? You don't want to be that person. So delaying is not being evasive. It's creating a dialogue where the person's interested in my opinion. So if Cindy and I are working together, um, I, you know, I want to delay answering about Ray. Now, if she pushes me and says, I want to know, then I'll give her my opinion. Of course. I, hopefully, I don't let her get to the point where she's so frustrated with me. Right? And then I would, I would use the three A's. What are they? Apologizing, acknowledging I could be wrong. Can't always use that one, but it's a good one. Acknowledging fallibility. And asking the person not to argue. That's the third A, agree to disagree. So Cindy asked me, and you can give your opinion anywhere in there. You can use one, two, or all three of those elements of this tool. So Cindy, you've asked me repeatedly about Ray. You, you really want to know? Yeah. Well, listen, I'm sorry. I, I could be wrong about this. From what I see in the paperwork, it just, it, it looks to me like you're not married to him. And I don't want to argue with you. I could be wrong. I hope we don't have to argue about this. Right? I'm still telling her my reality, what really is consensual reality, right? But I'm not saying, you know, it's clear you're not married to Ray. I'm saying, I'm sorry, I could be wrong. I don't want to argue with you. There's so many things we agree on. I'd like to work with you on those things. So that's the nature of how we give our opinion with this approach. And then finally, we apologize for acts and interactions, things that were hurtful to the person, like an involuntary treatment. Real important one to apologize for. And not say things like, well, if you hadn't done this, I wouldn't have had to do it. <laughs> no, just say, I'm really sorry. How did that make you feel? And, and what I hear often is people feel really traumatized by involuntary admissions. Um, I've involuntarily admitted many, many people. I've been a part of assisted outpatient treatment orders as well. These are really important tools that we have to utilize. How we do it can make a world of difference. So that once the court order is, is lifted or once the involuntary inpatient treatment is over, well, then what? If we have a relationship with the person where they feel engaged, they feel we respect them and don't judge them and they trust us, then we're, we have some influence over their behavior. With this approach, let me be really clear, it is not about changing someone's attitudes or beliefs. It is not about improving insight or illness awareness. It is about influencing behavior, decision-making. So my brother never understood he had mental illness, but he stayed in treatment for tw oh, close to 20 years, right? I influenced his behavior. Our relationship resulted in his changing his behavior, accepting medication for an illness he was certain he didn't have because of, because of his feelings about me. Quick examples of that first tool. And I, and I want you to imagine a tool belt with seven empty pockets in it, right, for these seven tools. They're not steps. And it's, it's designed to augment what you already do. You all know how to listen. Do you really need a psychologist to tell you listening is important? You don't. Um, but this kind of listening, which I'm going to give you some examples of, is a little bit unique for most people. Um, but these tools are to augment what you already do, not to replace it. So what does it look like? And these are from a, a research study we did on the Schizophrenia Research Unit at, at Columbia. Um, I don't need a hospital, there's nothing wrong with me. So you're saying, there's a preface. Let me see if I understood what I heard you say, or in this case, you're saying, you don't need hospitalization, there's nothing wrong with you, right? 
So there's three elements. That first one is a preface. The second one is get the person talking about something uh, and, and, and reflect back without judgment. And then ask them if they felt understood. Did I get that right? Here's another example. I know that you're with them and they're trying to kill me. So now I'm part of the delusion, right? Can you reflect that back? Why not? So if I heard you, I'm with the people who are trying to kill you. Did I get that right? Same three elements. I don't want anything from you. I didn't ask to come here. I just want to go. So if I heard you, you you don't want anything from me. You want to go. Did I get that right? Is that correct? Same three elements. And you can do this in any scenario, in any circumstance. The research on whether this approach takes more time indicates it takes less time than trying to you know, refute and, and do reality testing and convince the person. Here's another example. Judge, did the police tell you that I'm God? They arrested God. These laws don't, this isn't from our research study, by the way. This is from a, a colleague I work with. These laws don't apply to God and God doesn't need a lawyer. So what you're saying is you're God. And, and the laws don't apply to you because, because you're God and, and that's why you don't need a lawyer. Did I get that right? Anyone think you couldn't say that? And am I, whoops, am I agreeing with the person? Who thinks I'm agreeing? Anyone? Don't be shy, please. Okay, you think I'm agreeing? Let me tell you what it would sound like if I agreed. Let's look at that second one. I know that you're with them and they're trying to kill me. You know what? You're right. I am with those people trying to kill you. That's agreement. What you might be picking up, though, is the person, when I do that kind of reflective listening, will often mistakenly think I do agree with them. And that's why when we give our opinion, we do it with an apology. And we, and we are humble. Because we know it's going to be hurtful to the person if they've made that mistake. trying to decide if I want to tell you one more story before I wrap it up because I'm ahead of time. This is good. (laughs) Um, I'm going to tell you this story. It's a quick one. Um, Wanda Barzi, do you know who she, who she is? Wanda Barzi with her, with her husband kidnapped Elizabeth Smart. And, uh, and this was in the trial. I was hired by the defense to evaluate her. She had fired the two previous uh, defense, defense experts Because at a critical moment in their evaluations, one of them offered a diagnosis, told her that she had schizoaffective disorder. In the second one, she asked the person, given the first experience, well, do you think I have schizoaffective disorder? And that person said, no, not exactly, but I think you have delusional disorder. Um, So she fired both of them. She said to her lawyers, no way I'm talking with them anymore. And that's when I got involved. And I try never to say anything like that if I don't have to, clinically or forensically. So I met with Wanda for a couple of years, did a lot of reflective listening, a lot of empathy, got a lot of data, a lot of information on her mental status and, uh, and competency issues. And there was a hearing. And I can talk about this openly because it's, it's public record. Prior to the hearing, and I talked about this on the stand, uh, I met her in the court's hel- holding cell And she had never asked me, by the way, with all this reflective listening, she absolutely was convinced I believed what she believed, that she had been chosen by God based on a a brush fire in a campground in Florida. That told her, that signified that she had been chosen by God to be the mother of Zion, to recreate the, the correct Mormon faith and to reinstitute with her husband polygamy or celestial marriage. So this is all delusional you know, stuff. It went on beyond that. And I would listen to that and reflect it back and, and empathize. Well, how do you feel? I feel elated. I feel so blessed to have been chosen. And I said, I can see why you feel that way. So she, she thought I agreed with her. So fast forward. I'm in the court's holding cell prior to my testimony. And I said, said to her, Wanda, I want to apologize because you're going to hear me get up on the stand and say, you've got a mental illness. And I hope you can forgive me. 
Um, but the way I'm trained, uh, this is just, you know, how I've learned to, to label the kinds of experiences you're having. I forget exactly what I said, but it was along those lines. And she started to tear up and she said, it's okay, I know God sent you to me. It makes no sense. I get up on the stand, I get qualified. The lawyer says, and doctor, have you come to an opinion? Yes, within a reasonable degree of psychological certainty, Ms. Barzi has. And I looked right at her and I said, I want to apologize. From the stand, I looked at her and I apologized again. Uh, has delusional disorder. I met with her afterwards and she said, can I give you a hug? I said, sure, why not? You know, she gives me a hug and she said, thank you. I said, what are you thanking me for? And she said, oh, I know God sent you to me. That's all she said. Um, so that story for me really emphasized something that is counterintuitive, that when I contradict somebody, if I've established a relationship where they genuinely feel heard, understood, and respected, when I contradict them, it's not going to injure the relationship. It's not going to injure it. And that's been my experience more times than not. Not every time by far, but that, that particular experience really opened my eyes to the power of, of, of developing this kind of relationship so that I could testify in court, you know, about a reality that, that just wasn't hers at all. So over, overview of these seven leap tools and this metaphorical tool belt I was talking about. We listen without judgment, without reacting or contradicting the person, and, and we do it actively. We express empathy, especially for feelings that come from delusions if the person's delusional, so they feel less alone, and the anisognosia, so they feel my respect and lack of judgment and connection with me, and what they want. Even if it's delusional, I, I, I want to empathize with those feelings and, and normalize them when I empathize, right? I'd feel the same way. Anybody would feel the same way you feel. I find areas of agreement and abandon my goal of agreeing the person has a mental illness. And we partner on those things we've agreed on. So if it were Cindy and I, I've got a list of at least five things off the top of my head that we could, we could partner on, right? That don't involve her seeing Ray and those kids. I delay giving hurtful and contrary opinions. I redirect the person, but I ask permission to delay, right? One thing I, one thing I forgot to ask um, when, I, when I polled the women in the room who had given birth, uh, how many of you had a trusted loved one, a mother, a sister, an aunt, a friend, who's, who during your first pregnancy, you asked for advice about yours? Can you raise your hand? Yeah, I'm seeing most hands go up again. You know, when we delay, we want to become that trusted loved one. And I don't think that's an overstatement, a loved one. I think we can do that professionally. We give our opinion with humility and in a way that, that is genuinely respectful of the other person's truth. And then we apologize for acts and interactions that felt disrespectful or frustrating or disappointing, Right? And these are not steps. Again, these are tools that you use as you need them. I'm very confused about the time. Oh, good. Because you just reset it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> it's like, don't tell me I've got 15 minutes because i got nothing to say. Um, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> um, very much. Real quick, before I, before I give up the microphone, real quick. If you go to leapinstitute.org or the Henry Amador Center, hacenter.org, under resources, there are free videos where you can learn how to use this approach. There's about seven different scenarios uh, that, that we have there. Um, and uh, it's free. It's available to you. Please, I hope you'll avail yourself of it. Thank you very much. Special thanks to Cindy. Thank you very much. <laughs>